thanks for joining us for the next in our Empire Masterclass series as we continue this amazing educational masterclass series. I spent um, the day in Melbourne yesterday in the city with a few firms. Some of them can join, some of them can't. They've got something on at the MCG today, actually. So they said, look, we'd love to be there. And they were big Richmond fans as well, Cam. So yeah. they, they, they couldn't get here, but they certainly, they just sent me a message saying, enjoy the masterclass today. For those of you that are joining us for the first time, welcome again. My name is Paul Jantz. We are here for professional, thanks to Professional Partners Education and our fantastic sponsors at Hall Chadwick, Profit Master Global Outsourcing, iKeep and Lloyd's Auctions. Now, if you are joining us for the first time, you're welcome to PPE, which is Professional Partners Education. And if you've missed a lot of our content, you can certainly go back and have a look. So every single thing we do, every live show we run, we put into post-production and it goes onto our YouTube page. So Type in Professional Partners Education into your YouTube channel and we'll pop up PPE TV Plus. And everything is there for you guys. It's built for our accounting community and network. And it's all for you there, free of charge. Now, given my last 24 years, it's a funny thing. I was reflecting in the shower this morning and thinking about how long I've actually been in this accounting industry for and doing what I've been doing. So um, I've thoroughly enjoyed everything I do and I continue to do that. So with... Working with firms around the globe, one of the biggest issues we talk about and you know, we get called in to talk about with a number of accounting firms and financial services firms as well is around leadership. And I think when I first had the opportunity to approach Cam a few months ago and we spoke about this and I thought I would love to share this topic and with this particular speaker, not just his stories and what he does, but it's the way he, he'll take you through this. So let me introduce you to our amazing guest and the things we're going to work through today. So joining me for today's masterclass, I have the pleasure in working with an amazing, humble individual, probably, I reckon probably two years ago, or maybe even three now, it was sort of at the tail end of COVID as well, where I was struggling a little bit, looking for a little bit of inspiration. But this individual brings some amazing stories. Again, I mentioned before, experience to talk about our topic of leadership at the highest level. He was the youngest CEO of an AFL football club at the age of 24, where he ran one of the biggest footy clubs here in Melbourne, still exists today. Um, they, uh, they, they, they wear the yellow and black, and he's still a very passionate yellow and black man. There's no doubt about that. And then spent probably the last 25 years of his life as a CEO of Melbourne Football Club, Fremantle Football Club. Um, and, and we're going to hear all of the probably if I go back a step, ran these footy clubs probably when they weren't at their best states, you know, they were in problematic states, it's probably fair to say, and took on a massive challenge. He's going to share the wins. He's going to share the mistakes along the way. And you guys are in for an amazing hour, that's for sure. What you're going to hear is we're going to talk about some, let's call it how he'll challenge you and your emotional connection to build an intellectual connection. He'll talk about how you can be exposed to the idea of having a trademark. Who are you practicing at being? You'll learn the term Encora Emparo and borrow freely, apply uniquely. And people do not experience intentions, they experience behaviors. So when we're talking about leadership, this is everything that you're going to experience in the next 45 minutes because we're going to do something a little bit different. But let me introduce you. I know it was a bit of a drawn out intro there, but Cameron Swab, welcome to our masterclass. Thank you, Paul. It's a pleasure to be here and I um, appreciate the opportunity and one of the little concepts, and I suppose it comes from leadership but as much as anything, is the idea of honouring the role, you know, in, in terms of what we do. And as a leader, are you honouring the role? And uh, that'd be a little bit of a conversation that, that we have today. And uh, and so my, my objective, even, even in this moment, and we'll talk of the idea of principles and feelings a fair bit, that we, we can learn to trust our, our principles much more than, you know, we can trust our feelings, I reckon, at different times. And, and particularly because, you know, some of the circumstances that, and one of the reasons I did take on those jobs when the clubs were in a bit of crisis is they actually had situation vacant next to their CEO role. That was actually perhaps the biggest reason. It was never the thing that I was actually seeking to be in life was the, you know, the the just break glass clubbing crisis. Yes, yes. You know, I'd much prefer to be the CEO. You got to walk into a couple of premierships. There's no, there's no doubt about that. But, um, yeah, look, it, even just, you know, and we were talking um, off, off, offline just before, just with, with, with regards to a couple of 
um, people that we have in common, let's say, and Molly's an accountant, people mm. probably know Jason Cunningham quite well. And mm. you know, I don't know if Cunningham's is online or not today, but yeah. it, it's, it's, it's interesting when you go through and some of the, even some of the early photos that you see of you as a 24 year old, and you were a very mm. young looking 24 year old as well. Oh, well so. I'll actually show one. I'll show one today. So. <laughs> It'll give you a bit of an indicator of just um, where I was coming from. So yeah, yeah, brilliant. No well, to all of you guys joining, and I know there's more joining coming in every second, which is fantastic. Now we're going to do something a little bit different and quite unique. So this time I'm going to sit back and I'm going to hand over the full reins to Cam for the next 45 minutes or so. Um, I'll join you guys back online for Q&A and we'll definitely take some questions to anything you've got. So what I'm going to encourage you guys, and I'm sure Cameron's going to do the same, um, take notes. I'm a big note taker. I'm going to sit here and I'm going to take notes, uh, whether it, you like to put them in your journal. Uh, Cameron's a big one on his journals. I tend to type them out in my notes and then I run through them and I allocate time to actually go through them in detail and reflect on them. So I'm going to do what you guys are going to do and, and, and be fully immersed in the experience of the next 45 minutes. So Right, I'm going to switch off my camera. I'm going to switch off my volume and I'm going to um, join you. So I'll let you take over, mate. Well, thanks very much. And yeah, we, we decided to go this way. I thought that um, what I'd do is I'd, I'd draw on probably some of the core concepts of uh, some of the masterclass work that I that I do. And 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 really, ma majority of the stuff that I, it comes from is I, I probably, with, without knowing it, I think I present more as a tradesperson than as a than a sort of a leadership philosopher although i've actually studied leadership a lot and i think it's quite an interesting thing even asking yourself the question what do you need to be a student of is a really interesting thing and because my, my first thought in life when I, I decided to be a student of something happened by accident i was watching kevin sheedy actually it was i was a richmond supporter as paul mentioned and uh, my father alan schwab was secretary of richmond when i was a kid and and i was obsessed with all things footy growing up and uh and Kevin Shee was on World of Sport, the old World of Sport, on a Sunday, and he and he and he won the handball championship, and he was explaining how he was handballing, and he was handballing in a way which no one had ever handballed the ball before, and it's actually it was called the rocket, and it was sort of over the top, and and I remember when they turned away from him and went back to the panel, someone said, "Oh, that, that Kevin Shee, he's a, he's a he's a student of the game," and and I reckon I was about ten or eleven, and and I, and I pretty much made my mind up that was a pretty good thing to be a student of. And, and then over time, and the student of the game certainly created opportunities for me. And I, I reckon even obviously growing up in the environment as I did with, you know, a, a football person, that was that was a part of it. And, and, and then in time it was, I thought, well, the student of the game will only take me so far. And, and then really it was, I found myself more, and it was probably pretty related saying, okay, I'm a student of high performance or a student of human performance, because it was an elite sport environment that I was, that I was in. And and then, then in time, I realised that it was actually the thing I was becoming a student of was human behaviour and, and we're complex things and, and we're complex, you know, in terms of our own complexity. But you know, even that idea of having a principle of honouring the role is basically just saying, framing, you know, where you might be at when you get a bit nervous or, you know, you've got to present or, no, my, my, it's a simple idea, I'm going to honour the role. And so what you need to be a student of will be one of the questions of it. And so, because learning is actually hard, any, any form of learning is always going to challenge you. And because it's normally setting aside some belief that you already have, and, and are you prepared to swap it out for perhaps a new piece of thinking? And, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Now, I'll use some slides and some ideas which, which come from it. But it, as I said, it comes from a, a place may, mostly as a, a lived experience and but also a studied and the sense making which comes from it, which is one of the main things the leaders have to be good at is, is things like sense making, meaning making, you know, making good, all, all of that, that type of thing, making a sense of place for people. All those things are all, all key things that we're going to talk to. And so the talk, and I'll just click this on now, the, the, the talk's called In the Arena. And, and, and I love the idea of In the Arena. And it comes from the Theodore Roosevelt speech called The Critic. And, and I'd really recommend you look it up. It's the critic. People, a lot of people would be very familiar with it. And it's this idea, it's not the critic who counts. It's the person who puts themselves into the arena. And, and this is a literal photo of a group of players, Melbourne Football Club, entering 
into the arena in 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 you know onto the MCG, you know, which amazing stadium that it actually is. And it's a and and the idea of being in the arena is the arena in my summary of this speech is the arena promises many things and but it never promises to be fair. That that would be one of the things I take on, on leadership. And, and that's a line I, I I've taken from Neil Danaher, and I'll speak of Neil a little bit. And, and this is this is one of those wonderful images of you know a captain entering into the arena, leading a group of, of people. And the, the the one thing about AFL football, which which is a little bit unique, we, we draft our players at eighteen, and so we're drafting the most selfish human beings known to mankind, the eighteen year old male. And the very first thing we have to educate them on is, is selflessness. If you, if you can't transition to selfless, you can't survive this, this system. And, and that transition relies on, on, on one thing, really. And, and it's the idea of your role and understanding role. And so the three expectations, this is Max Gorn, the captain of Melbourne, who, who and the reason I use Max is I, I, I was at Melbourne when he was drafted and, and he's quite an eccentric sort of guy and he's very, com he's very comfortable with his size, and he's, he's a giant of a man. He's, he's one of those guys who can walk in the room uh, and the first thought you think is, fuck, you're big. And then, and then he can walk out the room, walk back in two minutes later, you'll think, fuck, you're big every time. It's, it's just, he's just got that presence about him. But his expectations of his teammates and their expectations of him in this moment are really quite simple. But there's a lot of ambiguity and complexity embedded in them. And, and the three expectations are, firstly, that they all know their role. And if, I, if this would be worth just writing down as a simple concept, which, which is always one that we'll come back to. First of all, they know their role. The second part is they accept their role. And the third part is they play their role. And often people say, well, I need more clarity as it relates to those things. Well, the one thing in this environment is, is, is clarity is very rare. It's actually a very difficult place to get to. And yes, it might be an, an ambition and outcome, but because we're, we're playing this game with an, on an oval ground with an oval ball and 36 players on the ground at any one time, there, there's no clarity in that moment. In fact, the clarity builds off connection and the connection then really builds off this idea of trust and belief. And we'll talk a bit about that. And so Max got to lead his team to a premiership in 2021, which was their first premiership in 57 years. And when the microphone was put in front of Max in that moment, he didn't talk about him or his team. He talked about the shoulders of which he stands on, which were those people who got the club to often very difficult phases during that 57 years. And I was thinking to myself how much he has come on as a person. And that, that, that leadership has actually made him the person that, that he is. And, and he was a captain at a relatively young age. But it always didn't go well for the, for the club. And, and people would know that there is a fairly storied um, this story of disappointment before they got to have their success. And, and this is the same play with head in hands. And I think we can all relate to this a little bit. And in one way or another, I often think to myself, you've never led unless you've woken up in the morning and your first thought's fuck. That, 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 and I'm sorry if I used that word too much, Paul, but it, it, it's, it is that sense of it. But we also know that we can't show up that way. We, we're, not, we're not measured by what's going on inside us, which is normally a response to something which is happening around us. We're measured by how we show up. And so one of the critical skills, if you like, as a leader is we have to become good at showing up, but not showing up in any sort of make-believe way but showing up in a way which is actually an extension of who we are. And that was perhaps one of the great lessons that I had to learn. And, and it took me a long time. And it might have been that I was young. It just also might have been that I wasn't very good. But one thing I'd talk about leadership as it relates to, to culture particularly, and that's where we, we're focused on it, is it, it's a skill that is learned and earned. It's learned and earned. And, and we all get to do it by doing it. And so it's moments like this, and this is the same team which, you know, the makeup of the side would have, wouldn't have been dramatically different. might have been six or seven players different to the one which won, in the, won the premiership, which is probably a fair way. But they just got thrashed in a preliminary final in, this is in 2018, in Perth. And they literally, there's high expectations coming into the game. They almost couldn't get the ball off the West Coast, who then went on and won the premiership that year. And this is a moment which I think most teams find whether they're up for it. And so one of my favourite lines is this simple one, what stands in the way becomes the way. 
because each group has to find its own way and it finds its own way through its own constraints, its own, you want to say we'd be okay if, no, no, we've got to work out what actually works for us. We've got to build a dynamic which is unique to any group of people. And this is, so this moment, 2021 and their premiership doesn't happen without this, without this loss and this reassessment. In fact, the next year, they almost fell back to near the bottom of the ladder. 2020, average year, but a lot of sort of introspection. It sounds like a fair bit of tension in the club. And then 2021 worked it out. And, you know, and they're still in, they're still in the mix now. It'll be, it'll be a tough one for them, but they're, they're competitive. It is the best Melbourne team since, you know, for the last 60 years, which is saying a lot. And one of my favourite athletes is this woman, Lane Beachley. And pe most people would be familiar with her. She's a seven-time world champion surfer. She won six in a row. And, and what, I, what I love about it, and I love this image, because th this is Lane Beachley in her element. She's sitting on her board in the water. But she actually talks openly about her struggles when she's not in her element. And often as leaders, we find ourselves out of our element. And the, and the reason for that is we're really not leading unless we are in a place of ambiguity or complexity or paradox. In fact, if not for ambiguity, complexity, paradox, we actually don't need leadership in the first place because decisions actually make themselves or someone else is making the decision for you. And if you're making an obvious decision and you're a leader, if you're, not, if you're making a decision which isn't one of ambiguity or paradox or complexity, well, you're probably doing someone else's job for them. Because really a good leadership way of thinking is that the, the, it, by definition, the less clear, the, the, the lack of clarity comes to the top. The danger is when as leaders we try to push it down, particularly when we get into the blame game. And blame is one of those um, feelings that we have that it's very easy to go to, but we need to be better at straight away, better than that straight away. Because one thing about blame is it defines friends really quickly. And and it's easy to sort of you can you can you can you can build connection through blame, but it's the unhealthiest form of that. And losing, you know, particularly in sport where there is a lot of finger pointing and and we have a very obvious outcome. It's a very big scoreboard at the MCG. Is often to look at that scoreboard and say and say that scoreboard's not telling the story that we think we're on track despite what that scoreboard says. Well, that's that's the leader dealing into the ambiguity. But Lane Beachley, the reason I love her stuff is she talks openly about her challenges when she's not in her element. And, and, and in many ways, you know, she will, she will talk of that with more pride than she does even her great success. And the little bridge that she's prepared to cross on, a, on every time she speaks and sort of models it, I think, in many ways, the, the bridge she crosses is, is, is one of vulnerability. And there's a lot of talk about vulnerability, Brownie Brown and all her work. And, you know, she, she will talk openly of that. And the vulnerability thing, and the, the reason I, I'll, I'll go to it pretty early in the piece is, is most leaders I speak to say that they want to be seen as an authentic leader. Well, there's no authenticity without vulnerability. Because the one, the one thing that we, we, don't, we don't want leaders who are knowers, we want leaders who are learners. Whereas every instinct is you think I have to have the answer here. To walk into a room and say, look, actually, this is a really complex issue we have, we've got, we're dealing with here. And I don't have the answer, but I'm confident that the answer is in this room. Because at any one time, you will only ever bring one set of, one set of eyes, one set of ears. But most, most importantly, you only ever bring one imagination into the room. And so to come in as the learner in that moment, as someone who may facilitate and build confidence in your team to create the answer is one of the great challenges of leadership. Because that's that little piece of vulnerability that you're showing. When we all, we all sort of signed up for this thing, thinking that we, you know, where the people expected to have the answer. And often you're being asked questions or coming to deal with, deal with issues that you've never thought about in your entire life. And so why I love Lane is she, she'll talk openly about her struggles with depression, with anxiety. She talked about her issues with alcohol. And so she's someone who shares her vulnerability as a means for us to grow. And, and there's embedded courage in that. In fact, there's no vulnerability without courage. And in fact, if, you know, an interesting thing, and I'll talk a little bit about this, is that I often, whenever I'm faced, I was faced with a difficult situation as, as a leader, in the, even in the midst of a negotiation over a player trade or something like that, I, I would just get a pen out and I'd write at the top of the page, what, what does this situation expect of me? What does this situation expect of me? And then I'd write, before, then I'd write down four words. And the four, the four words I write, the first one is brave. 
what, what would a brave leader do now? And often you only you know whether you're being brave or, or not in that moment. And the second one is, what would a calm leader do? So the third, second word's calm. So I've never made a good decision in my life when I'm angry, like at any level. Even when I'm angry with a dog, angry in traffic, never made a good choice. And if you're looking at modelling behaviour, you think about leaders who you see get angry, you know, and sometimes people used to play to that and, and they create intimidating environments. And there was certainly, I grew up in that era a little bit, I must admit. And the, and the third word is humble. What would a humble leader do? Because it's easy to make it about you, but it's not about you. And so the humility which comes through in that moment is, is fundamental. And the fourth word, and I've only just recently started to, to talk to this a little bit, and I think it's mostly through COVID, is, is compassionate. What would a compassionate leader do now? And often self-compassion is what, what's needed, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And so even in someone looking at, at, at Lane now and her as a surfer and modelling the behaviours that we're talking about, is that one of my favourite little lines is just simply this one, you, you can't stop the waves, but you can learn how to surf. So, so the waves of challenge are coming your way from a leadership perspective. You can guarantee, in fact, they're probably rolling downhill somewhere right now. The next big issue you're facing is probably already starting to emerge at some point. And your capacity to deal with it in that moment is, is, is the making or breaking of you as, as a leader. And you're not always going to get it right, but when you get it wrong, you learn. So we either win or we learn is my, my take on that. And, and this wonderful image of uh, all this, this but the, all the images I use, the sporting ones are captured by a guy, Michael Wilson. I've got a great respect for his work. And he's captured Eddie Betts in this, this moment. And, and those who know their football, Eddie Betts is perhaps the most joyous player who's ever played in the history of the game. He, he almost played the game with a smile. And, and he's one of those guys, he, he's, his deeds were so remarkable on the football field that you almost laughed when you watched him play. It was, more, it was more than just appreciation of talent. It was almost comedic, you know. It was roadrunner coyote comedic almost, you know. It was that, that capacity. But th th this is a photo which is clearly not one of joy. And, in fact, it, it could be a photo which is taken in a game of football of um, a player missing a goal or losing a game. The, the, the usual sort of feelings of... Um, of doing something, you know, of, of disappointment in a moment, if you like. But the, the, this moment of disappointment is he was having a shot for goal at, against Port Adelaide at, at Adelaide Oval, one of the most beautiful stadiums in the world. And someone's thrown a banana at him and he's seen it. And I, I think this is a image of exhaustion, of exhaustion. Because one thing that Eddie's also been prepared to do he, he's talk to the trauma of his life, the trauma of not just his, but obviously other Indigenous people. And some people don't like that. But he knows he's going to have to talk about it again. And so in this moment, he's, he's probably coming to terms with the fact that, okay, this is no longer about the game of footy I'm just playing. This is actually going to, I'm going to have to step into that space all over again, even though he's probably exhausted with it. But he's actually, the courage that he actually shows, he's now doing this full time for a living, as in trying to support Indigenous people in, in the way that he can, and he's, he's quite a remarkable person. And, and, I, and I look at this and, and I think of this little line here, it's the hard days that define us. And, and it won't be day one, it won't be day two, it would be, it'll be the repeating pattern of the hard days. We, we've all had moments, and I'll talk to a couple of those, but, it, but it's often the, the layering of them which is the difficult ones. If, it, if, it, if it's one hit, we can take it, but it's the second, third, fourth, fifth, and and that's which leads to this sort of leadership exhaustion, if you like. I mean, this is one of the things that we need to be good at, is actually how we deal with that. And that's personal, and I'll, again, I'll talk to that. And as a, as a Richmond person, it's interesting because I, I grew up as a Richmond person. I worked at Richmond, Melbourne, Frio. And then when my time came, it's almost like I was just drawn back to the, to the club I grew up with, the same way as you're drawn back to your favourite music or something similar when you're a young fellow. And, and I, love, I love this image, and this is the Richmond players honouring, and it was a choice made by the players themselves to honour their Indigenous teammates, you know, prior to a game at uh, the MCG, the Dreamtime game, playing Essendon. And, and I, I think this is one of those images which will stand the test of time. And, in fact, I, I, I just was watching the footy the other day, and it was in the MCG change rooms at Richmond, and, and they had this image up on the wall. And it was I don't know what other images they have on the wall, but they certainly had this one. And, and this is one of those 
that this this decision for the Richmond players, probably led by Trent Koch and their captain at the time, had had nothing to do with their president Peggy O'Neill, their CEO Brendan Gale, but had everything to do with them because they created the conditions for this form of leadership to evolve and happen and have the confidence in their people to do it. And, and what it says to me, this, even though this is a game of football and ostensibly the only reason sport is actually played is for the game itself, this, this image will live far longer than what everyone will ever remember the result of the game being. In fact, people have almost forgotten it now. It's a couple of years ago. The Tigers did have a, did have a win, but that, that won't be remembered. And, and one of the, the key decisions as leaders that we'll have to make is understand the difference between what seems to matter and actually what truly matters. And what seems to matter tends to be the noisiest stuff. And, and one of the choices we have to actually make, a, a, am I spending my life on the seems to matter stuff or the truly matters stuff? And the truly matters stuff is the stuff which will take you to a place of courage. There's, there's no doubt about that. Where it's going to be the most testing part for you because it normally relates to change and it might be changes that relates to culture, it might be changes that relates to plans, there might be change to actually say, look, I actually pushed us in this direction and I pushed us in the wrong direction and I've recognised that and I've made a mistake. That might be what truly matters in that moment. And we've all done it. And on a similar sort of theme, I, I just, I, I love this image. And, it, and it's a, oh, go back one. And it's a, the classic sort of, uh, um, the young fella meeting his heroes, you know, and we've all we've all had experience of this type of thing, I think, in one way or another. But I love that it's, you know, Collingwood coming out on the ground and, and the timeless nature of sport is that there's been young men wearing black and white striped you know, jumpers for the best part, you know, the most when they're at their absolute physical peak of life, you know, for the best part of 150 years, and then they, they share that. And that's the shoulders of which we actually then get to stand on. And this young fella standing at the top of the race, who I understand the story behind it, is he is a young fella who's really struggled with anxiety. And anyone who's had children who have struggled with that, I have a transgender daughter. So my, my daughter changed gender when she was seven, 17 years of age. She was Lockie and she's now Evie, which Evie was the name she was going to be if she was born a, born a girl. And, and I'm unbelievably proud of her. But anxiety was actually embedded in all of that, which you could imagine. And so a club actually in support, even in a little moment for this young fella, but he's, you can tell he's adopting his little power range of position as he's, as he's waiting there. But Scott Pendlebury, the captain, who is leading his team into the arena, just compare his look in this moment with the one of Max Gorn before looking every bit the Viking. But as soon as Scott Pendlebury sees this young fella, he smiles. And, and what, what this says to me is that there's this mix that we're always in, this place that we're all in. Everyone, everyone in this room now, everyone who's about to take the field here, we've all got a so far story. And, and building meaning and sense making from our so far story is a really powerful thing to do. I think everyone has to understand their own story and in many ways become good at telling it because we connect through story. We intellectually, we emotionally connect before we intellectually connect. And people want to go to the intellectual, which is the intellectual is show, your, show the world how smart you are rather than actually say, show how decent you are, how caring you are, how loving you are. And sport loves easy, even though there's nothing more performance oriented than elite sport, but we do love easy. We draft you and we tell you we love you. It's that, it's that. and we, we almost demand love of our people and they, then they give it. And they give it. And one of the reasons why it's always a very difficult decision-making environment is because it sits in that place of emotion, that place of love, you know, where people have invested and embedded their identity in their football club. So anyone in your, you, everyone in this room now, but everyone in your teams, you've all got a because story. And I, and I think a great way of actually connecting teams is for people to understand their because story. I'm here because... I'm here because of the opportunities given to me by my parents. I'm here because I, 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 I had this wonderful mentor in life or I was given an opportunity. And I can say without any shadow of doubt that every major, um, if you like, um, push in my career or, or anything which opened up at any time was because people saw something in me that I'd never seen in myself. And I was very fortunate from that perspective. So by understanding our so far stories, we connect, we find means by which we connect, but we're also motivated by our not yet story. 
And I love the idea of a so far story and a not yet story. And our role is to, even organisationally, every organisation has a so far story and a not yet story. And the combination of the two creates what we call an us story. This is the story of us, where we've come from and where we're going. And sporting clubs are great at this. And I really recommend people look to articulate their us story. And, and, I, and I relate very much to this image because that little fella in the Richmond jumper there, that was me as a little tacker as well. I used to hang around the footy clubs when, when Dad was running the place. And I love this image of Sean Grigg with this young guy here. And because of the images, Sean Griggs, you know, the Premiership Richmond player, they're not talking about marks, kicks, handballs, who he played on, how many goals he kicked. They're talking about shoelaces. Because in this moment, this little fella, if you have a look, he's still at the Velcro phase of life. And kids, kids have this, this wonderful will to go through each of their phases. And I, I just, it, sometimes we just could ask ourselves, whatever happened to that desire? And, and I found parenting almost this, this sort of process of, you know, you, you're pushing your kids through each of the phases and, and admiring their development, at, but at the same stage, just sort of grieving the, the loss of the child that they were, you know, because each phase has its own, its wonderful beauty. And I remember the last, when my, my last of my kids said, Dad, I, I don't need you to read to me tonight, you know, at night. And there was part of me which was joyous that I don't have that responsibility in life and very part of me which was proud because my kid can now read to themselves. But there's also a big part of me thinking I'll never get to do that again. And it's, a, it's an interesting sort of stage and I, I find that even with leadership, that's what we are actually doing. And one of my favourite sayings, and it came from my study of, I, I sort of had to restudy parenting when one of my children changed gender, is one of my favourite ideas is we build the child for the path and not the path for the child. And, and, and with Evie, I had all these things I was worried about, but I needn't worry because we actually had spent a lot of time, you know, building the child. And I often joke with her, I go, if it's nature or nurture, which has led to this decision, I said, it's both my fault because I'm, you, are, you are my nature, you are my nurture or our family's nurture in that way. And what, and what I love about this thing is the curiosity of a child. It takes curiosity to learn. So my only expectations when I get to speak is you do come from a place of curiosity. And a place of curiosity is just saying, am I open-minded? Am I prepared to have my mind changed on something? Because changing is hard. And so this is the next phase. It takes courage to unlearn because the, the ability to do something different often requires you to actually say, well, that piece of me is not serving me well anymore. And, this, and Paul mentioned this little line, which is perhaps one of my favourites. And this is just a copy of my IP and one of my books that I wrote. And in the book I've written here, I just set myself to write something, you know, once a week for, for a year. And I ended up with 30 or 40, 42 pieces, I think it was, in the end, put it together in a book. And almost every, you can almost read, and when I'm reading back over my own stuff, is that I can, I can remember where the idea first germinated. And so the, what I, one of my favourite ideas is this one, is borrow freely, apply uniquely. So if there's anything here today you want to borrow from, whether it's a quote, an idea, a piece of thinking or whatever it is, the chances are I've borrowed it from someone else. But the difference perhaps is I've actually turned someone else's knowledge into my wisdom by aligning with my own lived experiences, my own belief systems, my own principles, my own values, and, and someone else's becomes yours. And there's, a, there's an idea which is you are the same person in 20 years other than the people you meet in the books you read. And it might be the podcast we listen to, we could probably add to that now. But, the, but that's only for prepared to have quite a systematic approach to actually taking that information and saying, what, what am I going to do with this now? Am I, am I going to try this thing out? And I'm going to give you, with this talk, I'm going to give you one thing to try out. That's all, just one thing. And it's a really simple idea, but hopefully you'll get something from it. And this is what we're trying to do is turn knowledge into wisdom, someone else's knowledge in, into our own wisdom. And to do that's actually tricky. And this is the, the Melbourne girls last year when they you know, leading into the name about winning the premiership and Daisy Pierce. And I was involved in the development of women's football when I was CEO at Melbourne. And Daisy's been just an incredible person for the game. Is it, I, the one thing I love about sport is that sport's only measured by, by this idea. You need, need, it's, it's about winning the moment. That if you've made a mistake on the football field, you can't change. And you cannot change what's going to happen next. It's a very random sport. But what we have to be able to do is become great at winning the moment. And the key to winning the moment is learning how to be in the moment. 
And so we embed that, but in, in life, we really struggle with that. We've got things buzzing on our wrists. We've got bloody things reminding us. Our brain goes into all different directions. And one of the critical things as leaders, as a skill that we need to be able to develop is how do we bring ourselves into the moment? Because other, otherwise we catastrophize or we over, you know, we, we bang ourselves up about what's actually happened in the past. And I reckon that's one of the main reasons we have that, that feeling, the fuck feeling in the morning when we go. And the, and, and the whole thing just seems too big for us. And I think most of the work that I do comes down to one question and one question only. And it's just simply this, what does the role expect of me? What does the role you're playing now expect of you? And that's, and that's this, you know, and this idea even I talked of right from the start, honouring it. I think it expects you to honour it. It expects you to be good at it. It expects you to embrace the work itself. And often the work is very different to the work that you've been doing. The work is maybe you've got the opportunity on based on some form of technical capability, whereas now it's about you, the leader. That's how you measure it. Yes, and the technical stuff needs to take care of itself in that sense. And the fundamental expectations we have, and I've got, this is the All Blacks and Richie McCaw, and, and I got to study with them for, for periods of time. And, and it was one, one of the most wonderful learning experiences I had. And the thing I walked away from the, the time that I spent with them was this, was just the trying to answer this simple question. What is the optimal environment that enables this group to perform at its best? What are the conditions that we're seeking to create to enable this group to work at its best? Because every group has its own dynamic. Every group has its own, it's its own sort of rich hormone soup of behaviours and different people. And, you, and as leaders, we have to adjust to that dynamic. You know, if we come and say, no, this, this is the way it's done here, well, we're, we're basically, we're not, I, there's this idea I think is, are you, as a leader, are you an, um, an unlocker or an extractor? Well, the, the leadership of, of our generation is about unlocking performance. Yes, there might be a bit of extracting from time to time, but I grew up in an environment where a lot of people it was push, 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 so that doesn't work anymore. And if you try to play that game, mate, you're not going to win. So, it, yes, we have to be creating conditions which unlock performance in people. And for that, to that degree, and this is the Matildas, there's not too many sporting teams are going to play with more pressure and expectation on them over the next month than this group. And, and I've done a little bit of work with these guys in, in football over a period of time. My brother Brendan's been very involved in it. Is that the one thing I do know in any form of uh, organisation is that no organisation can outperform, um, can outperform its leadership. You can never outperform your leadership on a consistent. You might have moments where you do, but not consistently. And so from that point of view, and this is some of the lessons that we, we learned before, and I, and I think uh, Paul mentioned this about me being the young guy, a young 24-year-old CEO. Well, this, this, is, this is the image of me as the 24-year-old the CEO. And I, and I look at this photo and I can't think of myself as being in anything other than a boy band at this stage. I look like a 19... 60s boy band or something at the time. But I think it was actually going for the Gordon Gecko greed is good look, to be honest. It was that period of life. And the interesting thing is that when I when I took this role, my my because I, I grew up in the sport, and there's a great Richmond coach by the name of Tommy Hay. He used to come around our house every Sunday morning. My dad and he would would replay the game to each other, talk it out, and I'd sit there and listen. As a ten year old kid, you can pretty much get in anywhere. And I spent my whole childhood in and around the Richmond Footy Club. And this this tiger skin sat on the boardroom table of Richmond for the best part of fifty years. You can't imagine it happening now. But as a little fellow, you can imagine I was just obsessed with it. And then a few years later, I'm getting my photo taken as I'm now the, 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 the CEO of the footy club. And my father had then gone on and become the um, executive commissioner of the AFL. And in the era that he, he was at Richmond, they won, they won four premierships when he was there. So as a kid, there were four times in my childhood where I woke up on a Sunday morning and the premiership cup the Tigers had won was sitting on our kitchen table at home in Mount Waverley. And so I, I had this concept about what in life and I also got the opportunity when I first worked in football to work with Ron Barassi. So Tom Hafey, Ron Barassi, two iconic coaches of their era, had a very profound effect on my life. So I had this sense and also with my father what a great leader looked like. So the goal to be a great leader was, was clearly something I understood, but I had no capacity to be it in that way. And, and probably my first go at leadership was some sort of mosaic of all of those people. And that's probably not an unhealthy way because you've got to find the way which works for you. But quite quickly, you know, I worked out it was about being a great learner. And Paul mentioned before this idea of Ancora Imparo, Ancora Imparo. 
and I got to study fine art actually when I left footy. So I took a really big change. You know, um, it was only you know six or seven years ago I was studying fine art at the Victorian College of the Arts, and I learned that Michelangelo, even in his even in his in his eighties, I think he was eighty seven when they discovered this, he would write at the top of the page. And I'm going to talk about this idea of writing something at the top of the page. He would write Ancora Imparo at the top of the page, and he's and that what it, that is is still I am learning, still I am learning. And I think the thing which keeps us uh, vibrant and young and what it is embracing the idea of being the learner. So one of the principles I write down now, I have a trademark and we'll talk about a trademark, is the principle of still I'm learning and core in paro. And the other thing I learned about leadership during this time is this, you're, you're never ready. If you're waiting to be ready to take on leadership, it ain't, it ain't happening. Yeah, you, you, I used to think you'd, what you do is you become good at something, then you take it on. You know, somehow you could study being a leader before you become, you learn leading as you're leading and you learn through failure. And in fact, I think I gained my confidence as a leader through failure and coming through that failure and still being okay and still being prepared to take it on again. And then, and then probably the harshest failure you, you learn as a, as a leader in elite sport is a pretty cutthroat business. And this image is then taken, say, 25 years after that previous image, almost 30 years actually, after the previous image. And I'm walking out of the Melbourne Football Club. I've been sat, just been sacked as CEO and I'm walking out of my press conference with this uh, at this moment. And so, so I had a wonderful time in the game and it, and it, and it taught me so many things gave me but often the best and worst of times would be be fair to say in regard to that but if someone was to say you know once my head cleared once I, I got my sort of reframed again where I was at if someone said what was the number one thing that you'd learned in the in the last 25 years which was different to perhaps you thought it was going to be when you took it on it was just simply this that it's all on you but it's not it's not about you because we leadership, we often personalise it and we, we make it about ourselves. And that's a really dangerous and damaging place to be. So the focus we're going to have in, in talking it through, and I love this little idea, and this is this is a wonderful Geelong captain with young Sam, you know, the water boy at Geelong after the after the game. And I think he epitomised what good leadership potentially was. And so from Sam's point, for when, I, when I look at this, I think now, particularly as someone who teaches leadership, I, I, I actually thought when I first started out, it was all going to be about teaching leadership capability, almost at that intellectual level. But what, what I've since learned is that it, this is actually mostly about this, about having a leadership consciousness, about having a sense of ourselves in, in, in regard to it. And, and I think of this across three domains. And this, this, this if, if when I teach leadership, these are the, the layers that we teach in regard to it all. The first one we talk to is mindset. Is what 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 is your leadership mindset? You know, do what what how do you go about learning? How do you go about growing? How do you how do you make every day of your life, if not a victory, but at least a learning in that sense? Because that's what it will be for you. And, and then we talk about leadership skill set. This idea of do the reps, have the system, do the work. And if you're going to read one book on that, read Atomic Habits by James Clear. We don't rise to the level of our goals, we fall to the level of our system. So what is your leadership system of operation? And the third one is this idea of leadership identity, and I'll touch on this just to, to finish off this little chat. And leadership identity is, is our sense of self in regard to it. And the objective and the goal to make our leadership a natural um, expression of who we are, and that is, and that is a challenging place. And most of the time, I think of leadership in a really simple terms. I, th I think of it as a conversation. That the ones that we're, the, this is a conversation we're having now, the conversations you get to have, the conversations you choose not to have, and often the ones, the conversations we walk past when we shouldn't. And so, if, if I'm, and, and again, Paul touched on this idea. And the reason why this stuff's important is that people will often talk to talk to their their intentions as a leader. This is my leadership intention. But really, what we've got to do is understand that people, what they do is they actually experience our behaviours. And so, yes, you have to be able to you have to be able to try and 
work through how you seek to lead. How you seek to lead is just merely an intention, but recognise that people will experience us in different ways and we have to be aware of how they're experiencing us. And I got feedback, for instance, at one stage, I was, I was very intimidating. And it would be the last thing that I would actually seek, given that you know my, my mindset around leadership and what it is, but that's how people experience me. And so one of the little, and, and I'm, I'm not someone who gives advice, that's the one thing. And I think advice is, Basically, you're becoming a, uh, some sort of sage or whatever it is. I, I don't think like that. All, all, all I choose to do in the work that I do is share ideas. But one of the main ideas I'd share with you is this, is stop telling and start teaching. And why, that, why this is a fundamentally important thing is that if we're going to build the child for the path, not the path for the child, and it's such a safe and easy place to take ourselves when, um, when we become just a teller. Almost if you become a teller and not a teacher, you're almost denying your, the person who's working with you in that moment the opportunity of growing. And, that, and again, I think that's dishonouring it. And this concept, again, that I want to come back to is this idea here, is what is your leadership identity? How would you, and a good way of thinking about it is this, if you've worked with a group of people for the next 10 years, and you'd gone through the highs and the lows, you'd had your successes, but gee, you had some near-death experiences along the way. And you would turn around, you were having a, a little bit of a send-off and the closest people are in the room. And you actually quietly lean forward into the little microphone they've set up for you, a little stage they've set up for you for your final speech and say, look, I've never told anyone, but my leadership trademark is, and you explain what it is, and every single person in the room says, yeah, that's who you are. That's how we experienced you. And so we do this through the idea of a trademark. And why, why is a trademark important? Because a trademark will do two things. The first one, and I'll just explain the, the background and then we'll, we'll, we'll finish her up, is it's built on an idea which I first learned from when I got to work with Neil Danaher. And a lot of people would know who Neil Danaher is. And Neil, I was involved in his appointment of coach of the Melbourne Football Club way back in the day, and we got close. And Neil was a really tough person. He was, he, he certainly got that unlocker versus extractor, mate. He might have been a bit more extract than unlock initially. I think he learned to be an unlocker in time. But he, he had, his little trademark was when it's all said and done when it's all said and done. So at the top of the, the page each day, he wrote, when it's all said and done. Because the line he loved is, when it's all said and done, more is said than done. And he wanted to be a doer in that sense. And then Neil is diagnosed with motor neurone disease. And, and every there wouldn't be a person who hasn't either directly or indirectly had an understanding of what a devastating illness it is. But his response to that is not to wallow it's not to take himself on a trip to Italy go live in Tuscany he forms a charity called Fight MND which has now raised over a hundred million dollars for it to help people with the disease but won't help him and anyone who's seen him recently would see the, the devastating effect although he's had a longer period than most have in that sense I think he's had it for 10 years now so I think he's redefined this word what's possible what's possible so the goal is you write at the top of the page your trademark. Then you ask the question, what's possible? What's possible today? And I can guarantee you won't find the, email, the answer in your email, in your inbox. And most of us have our inbox as some form of proxy um, form of a to-do list. And then the second question we ask ourselves, and this is another beautiful photo of Neil with, with his daughter, Beck, who's almost become the spokesperson because Neil's lost his power of speech. And she's wonderful, but I've known again since she was a little girl, she was a little bit of a scallywag as a kid, but she's just the courage that, to speak on her father's behalf, but at the same time find her own identity in it has just been unbelievably powerful. So the second question we get to ask is what's important? What's important? So two questions today. So you write your trademark, what's possible and what's important? The reason I do, I've worked through this and I mentioned before about studying some art. And this is one of my drawings that I, that I did, trying to, trying to deal with. And one of the things I, I, I had to work through my whole CEO life as someone who had clinical depression. And, I, and, I, and I, I've only spoken openly about it in the last, the last little while. And in many ways, I'm trying to draw that, that, 
that sense of it in this in this picture. But one of my favourite artists is a guy by the name of David White who's got this saying, when, when your eyes are tired, the world looks tired. And, and one of the things that I've then, in, in terms of writing a trademark at the top of the page each day, the words I write are these, just a simple one, of finding something. So I write finding something at the top of the page and answer the two questions, what's possible and what's important. And the last little slide I'll, I'll show you is, is this one here, and it's just a weird little drawing. Because when I studied fine art at Victorian College of the Arts, the first thing they ask you to do is to draw a little self-portrait. I remember taking a photo of myself and drawing it. And, and then the black wing pencils I use, I then rub my eyes out. My, my wife hates this, this drawing. She's interpreted it as something very different to what I was because she lived my experience of clinical depression through the whole of our marriage and, and has had to work really closely with me at a time when I was under fierce pressure externally at that time. But I, I use this image not because I'm now looking at the world. I'm comfortable with the way I'm looking at the world through a whole fresh set of eyes now as someone who's studying fine art. And then just a, it was only a couple of years ago and I unfortunately I've had cancer and, and I was reading people's books um, as they were dealing with cancer. And, and I read one book, which unfortunately this person doesn't survive it. But he, he's, he's experienced, his name's Randy Porsche and the book's called uh, The Last Lecture. It's a wonderful book. But I remember it being taken by a line in that book, you know, particularly someone who was sort of dealing with you know, my own mortality at, at that point. And fortunately, I think I've come out the other end, I should be okay. Is, this is a simple line he wrote in the book. And I think it's probably the, the, the reason why I, I, I come back to that trademark every day. Because the one thing I think as leaders and in life and as parents and all the various roles that we actually play is trying to answer this question, which is simply, what do I alone truly have to offer? What do I alone truly have to offer? So hopefully you've been able to get something, draw something from the conversation that we've had today. And this is the question that we're, that we're seeking to answer. So thanks very much, Paul. I think I'm sort of round about, I think I've landed sort of round about in the right place, hopefully, and, hope, and, and I trust that people have been able to take something from that. Thanks. Yeah, brilliant, mate. Thank you, thank you. It's, um, it's, 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 it's a funny thing is when I went through my process with you probably a couple of years ago when, you know, we were, if, you're, if you're a Melbourne person, we were, look, you know, we were locked down for the best part of two years and you do start to, you know, the mental health issues that came through that uh, were, were, were heightened um, depending on where you were in life. And I think the ability to sit down and I've taken my whole heap of notes and funny enough, I was reflecting on my notes from a couple of years ago with you in a similar format. And it was like, yeah. well, what are the, the key things that I've achieved over that period of time? And what is, like you're saying, what's the next stage of what I want to achieve as well? So it's actually mm -hmm. been quite empowering to actually sit back and reflect on that and move forward and then go through the same process today and go, right, how is, how, it, it, it is, it is phenomenal because I, I know I've taken some massive steps as well in my life, which has been very positive. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I'm obviously very grateful to you for be able to share that with us and obviously sharing that with everyone today. Um, to everyone online, you've got the ability to throw some questions into the Q&A. If you've got anything you'd like to ask Cam, please throw that into the Q&A. I know we covered a fair bit there. I think, you know, some from my point of view, I suppose, looking at the, the you know, the four words of brave, calm, humble, compassionate, mm. um, you know, what would a brave leader do? What would a calm leader do? What would a humble leader do? What would be a compassionate leader do? Mm. I think they're really good questions to ask of yourself and you can sort of dig deep into yourself to actually ask you of that. So it's, it's mm. brilliant. We've got one there coming through. Yeah. So it's mainly, the, again, focus on system. So in, in moments, come back to system. And, and sport builds off system. So I don't, I don't think of sport as team versus team, club versus club. I think of it as system versus system. The most important system that we have is our learning system. And so creating that inside our organisations, because then we actually get to find out who we've got in the room by testing them as learners. Yeah, okay. Because yeah. the number one thing that we're trying to have, even in that sense, is we want to have people who are prepared to take responsibility for their own development. Yeah. And so if we, if we, how do we ever find that out if we don't create an environment to enable that to happen? And I mentioned before that my friend, I found myself in recruiting, and that's how I got my first chance in life because Ron Barassi saw something in me I'd never seen in myself. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, look, I actually noted that down because it, it took me back to probably maybe 20, 25 years ago when someone actually said something very similar to me. And I suppose as, as a young person coming through, you, don't, you may not necessarily 
recognize those traits in yourself but when somebody mm. else sees that and tells mm. you that yeah it, mm. it sort of triggered something in my brain to maybe something 30 years ago when i became a general manager ceo mm. of a company it was like interesting that actually resonates but yeah. I love the bit that you talk about in terms of learning and the ability as a leader to continue to learn. And that's something that I've become very passionate about, you know, for someone that, to be fair to everyone online, geez, I'm being a bit vulnerable here. I I, I didn't even complete year 12, mm. um, you know, mm. so even to sit back with, you know, I've got three amazing men that's in my life, my three boys, and mm. to share that with those sorts of things. And they'll turn around and say, yeah, but dad, you didn't actually complete year 12. <laughs> yeah. it's like yeah, yeah. But that doesn't stop you from continually learning and that's no. just one part of learning and there's other parts of your whole life that you're going to continue to learn and then share and i think that's a great thing about children as well they're pretty honest about things uh, they are particularly at certain stages i think one of the questions is i think is what from stuart what was the one thing you wanted to be remembered for um i probably didn't have that in my head a lot when i was doing it but if i had a reflection and uh, and I think it'd be something really basic that I would, something like I was just, I was always decent. I, I'd like to think people found that I was always decent. And that's, that might seem a really low bar, um, but it was, and, and perhaps maybe even generous might be. So that they're not, they're not necessarily super ambitious words, but I, I think if we, 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 we connect on, um, we connect on believability, I think, and 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 I reckon there were times where I, my ego had become so either fragile or or ahead of itself. Particularly, I reckon there was phases in my early thirties where fuck, you know, I, I wouldn't have been easy to work for, you know, you know, I'd been in the role six or seven years and. Probably feeling pretty good about myself, but don't worry, I've got my come up at speed time, you know. So, yeah. so I think that was one of the things I learned. I got sacked twice as CEO, and so I, I probably right from if someone, so I think people hopefully found me as being just a decent person would be what I would hope. Yeah, nice, nice, well said. Thanks, Stuart. There's another one here from James. Hey, James, good to have you online, mate. We need to catch up soon. The concept uh, of you never ready is an interesting one. How far ahead of the curve do you give someone a chance to lead without setting them up to yeah. fail? Great question. Um, being okay that they do is probably part of it and being there for them when they do because they will fail and, um, and you know, hopefully it doesn't do grievous injury to the organisation when they do. But the, the, the recognition is that you're going to do, the majority of your learning will come through your failures. And and it might be just the subtle ones. There'll be the, you know, the ones which would be the big hits. But but it is because we, you know, the um, um, there, there's a wonderful line, Matthew McConaughey in his book, Green Lights, he says, mate, there are angels of truth everywhere. We just, we tend just not to access them until we're fucked, is the line he uses. So, so often that's when we're actually struggling with something. And and so to actually support them and help them through and allow them to learn their own lessons, not 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 do that. And that's the child for the path mindset. So I'm always comfortable. I, I always used to back people in before they were ready, but mainly because someone did that with me. And yeah. and and but then not just leave them, not not leave them be you you become the, 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 there's leaders who you meet who you feel good about them, you know, they've got a certain charisma and capability. But the people that have the most impact on your life, the ones who make you feel good about you. And so even embracing that as your leadership mindset, you, you, you do want to be able to stand up in front of a group and hopefully that they feel enough confidence and belief in you and the way that you can articulate the future and where we're heading and deal with issues. But but mostly it's the personal connection. And, and, and that know your role, accept your role, play your role comes from your capacity to build connection with whoever you're asking to do that and, and, and then of you in that sense. So I always back young talent in, no doubt. Or, or go early on it yeah yeah it's a funny thing that you can you can um because i'm involved in our in our footy club as well and i coach um obviously i love doing what i do and i've got the pleasure of doing this and sharing a lot of this knowledge and my own thoughts as well but then taking that know your role play your role is such an important one you take that into even to junior footy and coaching yeah. uh, teaching them about how important that is that as a Yes, we have 
team success, I think that's really important. And then whether it's team success or company success, there's, yeah. there's always a bigger picture there. And I think you can, yeah. there's there's so many layers there that you can add to that. So yeah. Um, yeah. thanks, James. And thanks, Stuart, for your comments and George as well, for for all the comments that you guys just made then. It's it's very much appreciated. Cam, any, uh, any final words you'd like to leave? Any, every no, just, to, just think about that a go. Just think about what you'd write at the top of the page, you know, yeah. and um, like, well, let me just quickly show you. Like each, each day in my notebook, each day in my notebook, they're, uh, yeah, finding something. There we go. Do good work, enjoy and look after myself, find a creative space, be present with family and friends, stay organised, then two questions, what's possible, what's important. So that's just the simple way of doing it. And it just sets my day up. And... And it'd be fair to say that there are days where you don't feel like doing it. It's like the saying, you don't feel like going for a run. I think we're either we're either moving towards something or away from something. An exercise like this just moves you towards something. Um, whereas often just, you know, if we just allow the day to happen, we, we're moving away from something and half the time we don't even know we're moving away from it. And 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 so you'd like to think everything's it. And I got that actually from um, Moby, you know, the musician Moby, and, and he's, he's, a, he's an alcoholic and... But he's hasn't drunk for 25 years, but he still calls himself an alcoholic. Um, and his mentor, his alcoholic man, he said, You're either moving towards a drink or away from a drink. That's that's his mentor told him. And I thought, well, you can make the same application with you're either moving towards good health or away from good health. You're moving either towards, you know, being a more impactful leader or away from it. You know, whatever it might be, you're moving towards creating those conditions or away from it. So just some progress is better than no broker at progress. So just little moves forward is often the Yep. Often, yeah. And I think I think um, just sharing a quick one before we wrap up. Uh, you know, again, just what 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 I do, and and I suppose what what I took out of this a, a couple of years ago, and my continued learning experience was that I've now allowed myself what I call a creative day, and that yeah. is Fridays, and it's blocked out of my calendar every day. I only work four days a week. Um, I've again trained myself that I can be really effective in four days, and I can have that one day to learn. Um, you can, teach, you can, yeah. Create, would you take a day off to read a book, for example? You know, if you yeah. can read a book in a day, you know, that's really powerful. Yeah. And in a really conscious way as well, not just in that fall asleep, read two pages and fall asleep sort of way, you know, that's sort of conscious way. Yeah. 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 So, you know, again, it can be achieved if you work hard enough that that's what you're looking for. So, um, yeah. so if it's I'm important sure. enough, that, yeah, that's exactly gonna... right. Yeah. It's going to make it important. Yeah, exactly yeah. right. It's all about trade-offs. You know that. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you, much. If anyone wants to connect with me, obviously yes. LinkedIn. Certainly do that. Um, anyone's looking for any stuff to work with their teams or individually, well, like this is this gives you a bit of a framing and an idea of the type of work I do and the approach I make, and that's why I enjoy the opportunity you presented for me, Paul. I appreciate yeah, it. Mate. Thank Hopefully you. I've honoured it. That's the, that's the goal. Yeah. Absolutely. It really was. And thank you for, again, sharing your knowledge, expertise. I think to all of you guys that have been listening, um, hopefully this is the start of your leadership learning journey. Uh, maybe it's again that you can add a few layers and I suppose everything that you might have taken notes. Again, again, this is the great part about this particular masterclass series. It is recorded. It'll mm. be on our YouTube page probably in the next couple of days. So you've got the ability to go back, to listen to it, to take notes. I know George mentioned he was too busy to take notes. Um, that That's a part of the journey as well. Also recognizing yeah. sometimes that you are too busy that you can go, right, there's a lot that was shared in 45 minutes there. How do I start taking one or two things and just start applying them? Thank you very much. Cameron Schwab, thank you, mate. It's thank you. Thanks again for the opportunity. Appreciate it. Fantastic. To all you guys, thanks again for joining us, uh, signing off till I see you next time. Enjoy the rest of your day. Mm -hmm.